So now I'd like to introduce our main presenter today, uh, Dr. Gediminas Lasutis, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Cambridge uh, in the Department of Geography. Before joining Cambridge, Geddes completed his PhD in politics at the University of Manchester, where he undertook research on politics and social sustainability of extractive industry in Mozambique. And his first book, The Politics of Precarity, based on this research, is coming out with Routledge uh, next year in 2022. Within the DCP project, Geddes has been carrying out research on the local impacts and socio-political effects of mega projects, specifically the Standard Gauge Railway in Kenya and the Lamu port development also in Kenya. So Geddes, we're gonna hand over to you for about 20 minutes of your presentation before we move into the next part of the day. So thank you, over to you. Uh, thank you, Chris, for the, for the introduction and good afternoon, everyone. I'm very excited to present a part of my research to you this afternoon. I was saying in Kenya, uh, my main research question is what have been social and political effects of mega infrastructures in Kenya? And in other words, I'm interested in an understanding how infrastructure development alters power relations between different population groups in Kenya. I specifically ask who benefits, who loses, what are the opportunities and challenges presented by infrastructure development, and how do people cope with the changes induced by mega infrastructural developments. So asking these questions, I approach infrastructure not as a neutral technical object, but as a socio-political process that mediates power relations within society. So in other words, infrastructures interconnect people, objects, and landscapes as they produce spaces through which modern socioeconomic systems operate mega projects essentially function as a part of complex social and political relations. So with this theoretical background in the context of Kenya, I have undertaken on the ground empirical research alongside the standard gauge railway. Gettys, you've become muted for some reason, I'm not sure why. Uh, you, had, you had just said alongside the standard gauge railway. Yeah, okay. Uh, so this railway has been funded from, uh, with financial loans from the Import Export Bank of China and started operating in 2017. And to date, extending over 470 kilometers, it, it is the biggest transport infrastructure project in the country. Alongside this, I've also carried out research in Lamu County, where I specifically focused on the construction of Lamu Port and its impacts on local communities as they are unfolding as part of regional Lapset corridor that interconnects Kenya with South Sudan and Ethiopia. So those of you who are interested in learning more about my research in more detail can have a look at these two articles on sociopolitical effects of mega projects in Kenya that I recently published in international peer reviewed journals. And as the presentation will be shared later on, you can get the details um, after the talk. For the purposes of today's presentation, I want to discuss one key pattern that has emerged in my research on both the SGR and LAMO port. <laughs> So the past half decade has seen a resurgence of various mega projects across Africa, including dams, railways, ports, and pipelines, which is quite a controversial development after decades of critique that exposed environmental, economic, and social costs of such projects. Contemporary mega projects, like their predecessors of the 20th century, continue to be imagined as symbols of development and modernity and as keys to national development. Uh, Kenya is no exception here. Its national government has promoted mega infrastructures, and I quote, as a driver to socioeconomic growth and development that defines the path to transformation and evolution of human society. Both the SGI and LAPSET are, are flagship projects of the National Development Program Vision 2030 that focusing on these mega projects aims to transform Kenya into a newly industrialized country, overcome its aid dependencies, and achieve a middle income status in less than two decades. 
However, in spite of such rhetoric of prosperity and development, there's one key social pattern emerging in my research that complicates this representation of mega infrastructures as national development. The socioeconomic effects of mega infrastructure development are uneven and differentiated as both LAPSET and the SGR enhance the pre-existing pre relations of difference. In other words, privileged groups with sufficient access to various resources might experience a number of benefits as a result of infrastructure development, whilst disadvantaged groups, particularly those who have been historically marginalized, find it much more difficult to sustain themselves as a result of infrastructure development. So let me give you a few examples of this dynamic. The SGR development and land acquisition, for instance, are beneficial to large-scale landowners who have received sizable financial compensations for their land availed to the SGR project. However, on the other hand, smallholders or squatters who do not have official land titles had to vacate the land that they had occupied without any financial compensation for this land, which further entrenches the pre-existing forms of land insecurity that are closely intertwined with poverty levels in Kenya. Transport infrastructures also advance mobility of urban classes, particularly those who regularly travel between Mombasa and Nairobi, as the new railway is more efficient than other modes of transport it is undoubtedly a significant improvement in Kenya's regional travel system. But at the same time for the populations in rural areas, the new railway presents a number of challenges, as in many cases, the railway blocks the existing travel and access routes, sometimes even dividing family lands and splitting villages, thus significantly affecting people's daily lives. Another example of social differentiation created by mega infrastructures is the central areas of Kenya that historically favored by central governments have recently witnessed significant changes in real estate development that are related to the construction of the new industrial dry port and customs clearing facilities that are being relocated to central Kenya with the SGR development. Since 2016, for example, such areas as Maimahiu or Suswa, in these areas, land value has increased threefold as various individuals with private capital are rushing to secure access to the expanding industrial developments in the area. At the same time, however, areas such as Mombasa that historically have been marginalized by the central Kenyan state apparatus are experiencing decline in business opportunities as the customs facilities are being relocated to the new industrial dry port in central Kenya and the national transportation industry is increasingly being monopolized by the SGR. Uh, another example of how mega infrastructures uh, create uneven effects is that they privilege economies of scale and private capital investments that support them, but simultaneously marginalize small scale informal livelihoods without providing any real alternatives. In Lamuk, for instance, where 70% of the local population depend on artisanal fishing, access to the sea is central to lo local livelihoods. This, however, has been severely impacted by the construction of Lamu port as part of Lapset corridor that has displaced and is displacing local fishermen from their traditional fishing grounds. So in this context of these examples of how uneven mega infrastructure impacts are, one might ask, why does this happen? At an official state level in Kenya, there are several political justifications for this differentiation created by infrastructure development. On the one hand, some government officials see this dynamic as something that cannot be avoided. According to them, and I quote, social issues by their very nature cannot be resolved. It is natural that some people will lose out as a result of national development, end of quote. On the other hand, other government officials observe, and I quote, 
that it is inevitable that these mega projects will not benefit everyone. Currently, the government does not have technical capacity to oversee everything. We need better planning, decision-making, right interventions and coordination at all project stages. However, approaching infrastructure not as a technical object, but as a political question and a political relation highlights that these differentiated socioeconomic impacts of mega projects are not just accidental byproducts of development. There's nothing natural or inevitable about mega infrastructures, nor are they only technical problems that, can, that concern the lack of capacity. Instead, both the SGR and LAPSET are elite projects that, has, that have strong political support, and thus they deliberately favor specific economic, social, and political agendas, whilst deliberately ignoring others. For instance, this dynamic of power articulated through the SGR becomes apparent when we consider the explicit political backing behind the project. The SGR, as one of the flagship projects of Kenya's Vision 2030, was promoted by the presidential office of Uhuru Kenyatta as part of his Jubilee re-election campaign. Whilst the office of the preceding president, Kibaki, planned to upgrade the already existing railway line, Kenyatta, in contrast, made a very controversial decision to take loans from the Exim Bank of China and construct a completely new railway. This in Kenya led to a number of critiques from political opposition and national civil society about the project's financial and sustainability, as well as the involvement of Kenyan political elites in financial agreements with the Exim Bank. Importantly, these agreements, shrouded in secrecy, are not accessible to the public. In this context, where the SGR project was politically pushed ahead despite the arising controversies, it becomes difficult to contest the project. As one local county officer observed, and I quote, what the president says becomes a national decree that all have to follow. To contest it would be a political suicide. So these projects just go ahead, even if they do not meet all legal requirements. End of quote. Besides the national context of Kenya, the SGR was also initially promoted as a part of transnational logistic networks, increasingly being shaped by China's Belt and Road Initiative. This initiative adopted in 2013 by the Chinese government in order to support infrastructure development in nearly 70 countries across the world also includes Kenya, where the construction of the first two phases of the SGR was linked with the Belt and Road Initiative. While Kenya and China relations have a long history, their bilateral ties have strengthened over the last decade, primarily through road and railway construction that allow the realization of different state agendas. So Kenya's Vision 2030 and China's Belt and Road Initiative. Therefore, in this context of different political agendas behind mega projects, it is not surprising that negative social impacts of mega projects might be overshadowed by specific political interests and priorities. This dynamic is particularly made apparent by the lack of effective social and environment impact assessment. In Kenya, according to local activists, in the best case scenarios, local populations, instead of being consulted about potential social, economic, and ecological impacts, are simply informed about the arrival of new projects. This usually happens in community meetings where government officials present their coming projects to village leaders. These presentations are very often dominated by narratives of a better life, development, lifelong employment that are simply used to convince the representatives of these communities to support mega projects. And those who challenge these narratives are labeled as anti-development and anti-government in an attempt to undermine their legitimacy. However, in this context, uh, Kenya civil society, despite all the challenges, has mobilized to challenge these socially exclusionary and disruptive pro 
disruptive development projects. This particularly has been the case with the construction of Lamu Port as part of LAPSET. In Lamu, witnessing infrastructure development taking place without appropriate community consultation, several local civil society groups that work on human rights, socioeconomic development and community empowerment united under the Alliance of Save Lamu in order to challenge the Kenyan state and its development practices that are exclusionary. Through community-based research and mobilization, this alliance has started to document the already existing and potential future effects of Lamu port, particularly on artisanal fishermen in Lamu archipelago. Save Lamu also took the Lapset Corridor Development Authority and the Kenyan government to the High Court of Kenya over this issue. In May 2018, in the unprecedented High Court hearing, Lamu Court was successful in holding the Kenyan government accountable. The High Court of Malindi ruled that the Lamu Court construction resulted in clear violations of the right to public participation, the right of information, the right to clean and healthy environment, the right to culture. The High Court also ruled that the central government did not involve the local county government of Lamu in the Lapsa project planning and implementation. In relation to the livelihoods of artisanal fishermen, the court also ordered the Kenyan government to report on external costs of the project, recognize fishing rights as amounting to property, and pay compensations to nearly 5,000 fishermen that had been displaced by the construction of the port. Civil society has also mobilized in the case of Mombasa, particularly challenging the SGR transportation decree that obliging containerized cargo to be shipped by the new railway negatively affected other transportation sectors and related industries in Mombasa and broader coastal region. Since 2019, Okoa Mombasa or Save Mombasa movement has also pressured the national government to make the actual financial agreement between the Kenyan government and the Import-Export Bank of China publicly available. And last month, just like Save Lamo, Okoa Mombasa took the national government to the court over this issue. So, In conclusion, based on this brief discussion, I kind of wanted to highlight that mega infrastructures do not anonymously bring development as promised by national governments, but accentuate the pre-existing, the already pre-existing relations of socioeconomic difference across Kenya. The idea that I put forward is that where we see infrastructure development as having negative side effects, we cannot assume that it is a technical problem, a lack of capacity that can be fixed by right policy interventions. In other words, infrastructure development is not a technical, but a political issue and question. So in this context where mega infrastructures function as part of social and political relations, when we ask what can be done about mega infrastructures to make them more sustainable and more socially inclusive, I would encourage us to think about this question as a question of inequality, as a question of power, and as a question of socio-political contestation. Uh, therefore, in order to achieve sustainability, there's a need for both. We obviously do need capacity building and technical support for national government institutions in planning, implementation, and monitoring and evaluation of development projects at different stages. However, at the same time, it's equally important to support civil society groups that can challenge authoritarian government practices, represent historically marginalized groups, and try to make national governments accountable to the public. As we see in the case of Kenya, civil society mobilization has been central in trying to make uh, large-scale infrastructural projects less exclusionary and represent the development needs of people who are, might be excluded in the development visions that mega infrastructures represent and mediate. Also, whilst I do not discuss this, I would also like to highlight the importance of transnational alliances between different organizations and civil society groups to build pressure 
not in just national governments, but also project financiers, implementers, and contractors to adhere to sustainability standards and procedures. So I think I'll, I'll leave it here for now before we go into the panel discussion. Thank you everyone for listening. And I also wanted to extend special thanks to my colleagues in Kenya who assisted with this project and uh, all the research participants that made this project possible. Thank you all. And now we'll go to Chris. It's now um, my great pleasure to uh, move on to the, to the panel part of the, the session where we're going to be hearing from Akshay Vishwanath and from uh, Sarah Childs. Um, so I'll just quickly um, introduce them to you all first before um, posing some questions to them. So um, Akshay Vishwanath is, uh, has spent most of his career working on the governance aspects of natural resource management in Eastern and Southern Africa. He has wide ranging experience in the fields of water resource management, landscape and wildlife conservation, community participatory approaches, advocacy and lobbying and strategic planning. He's passionate about mobilizing people, communities and organizations to tackle our most pressing environmental challenges. And in March of this year, he was recognized as one of the top 100 young African conservation leaders for his work that promises to leave a lasting impression in the African conservation landscape. And uh, he's also been, he's been very active in the uh, Save Nairobi National Park campaign, which I think is uh, obviously highly relevant to the case of the SGR, which cuts across that national park. Um, Sarah Childs specialises in environmental governance with the aim of harmonising grey and green infrastructure, which means built and ecological infrastructure in economic growth corridors in Africa. She has nearly seven years experience working in East Africa on conservation strategies and programmes for areas of high biodiversity value, experiencing significant investment in agriculture and infrastructure. These include the Southern Agricultural Growth Corridor of Tanzania, otherwise known as SAGCOT, and the Lamu Port South Sudan Ethiopia Transport Corridor, otherwise known as LAPSET, in northern Kenya. And she has further experience in landscape level planning in Uganda, Ethiopia, and Zimbabwe. She hails from South Africa and has previously worked on urban and peri urban conservation projects in Durban and KwaZulu Natal. So, welcome to you both. You clearly bring a lot of a highly relevant experience to the, to the panel today. Um, just while I'm asking some initial questions to both Akshay and Sarah, please do. Um, add your own questions from the audience for Geddes or for the panel, or, or just to share your thoughts and comments on the, on the subject of our, of our webinar today. We really do want to make this latter part of the session highly interactive and to, to hear from you all as well. So first of all, I'll, I'll just put a question to, to Akshay. Um, based on your experience- um, Sorry, Chris. Chris. Yes. I'm just going to interrupt. Akshay has just sent a message to say that he's struggling with his Wi-Fi. So uh -huh. he's trying to reconnect and perhaps you can ask me a question first. I certainly will. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah. <laughs> That's good to know. I don't want to ask a question into the abyss of the, of the internet. So Sarah, so um, you, I think, have had some experience of uh, kind of more participatory early engagement with uh, local stakeholders in infrastructure development, uh, perhaps compared to the situations that Geddes was describing. So how, how do you think community interest can be built into this kind of process and what, what are the benefits when that uh, happens? Thanks, Chris. That's a great question. Um, so firstly, if I may, I'd just like to set a bit of a philosophical underpinning um, or foundation for my comments. And um, I'd like to say that in my view, one of the areas in which we've gone wrong is by falsely separating out the environment and, and the social in the processes with which we um, engage to think about planning large-scale infrastructure development. And an example of that is um, our move from environmental impact assessment as a term to environmental and social impact assessment, and the same um, can be said for SEA and now SESA. Um, and I think what, what that's done to our thinking is it's led to a tick box or template approach to um, including community, local community voices in, in these projects. Um, and so we can often be quite reductive in our thinking rather than thinking about the complex relationships that humans have with um, the ecosystems and the local economy um, in, these, in these various landscapes. 
And in the same way, um, the term environmental and social safeguards can also be reductive because it's it's a reactive way of thinking rather than thinking about proactive visioning, engaging communities and proactive, proactive visioning for these landscapes, for these regions, um, and, and heading in that direction rather than tacking on a safeguard at the very end of the process. So um, that's what I'd like to say to start, um, and that at Owasi Lions and Gravy Zebra Trust, um, we work in three different counties in northern Kenya and Isiolo, Samburu, and Maasbek counties. Um, and our thinking and approach is very much community-based, um, indigenous knowledge informed, and we don't see a, a real separation between the social and the ecological in this landscape, given that it's a pastoralist landscape um, and people depend on the resources in the system um, for their livelihoods. Um, and a few of the a few of the um, approaches that we've taken um, to really promote deeper engagement of community voices and infrastructure processes um, run along the lines of our three program pillars. So the first is um, local level awareness and information dissemination. And what we've really tried to do is make sure that communities who are going to be affected by infrastructure development really understand what this infrastructure means, what it looks like, um, so that they can more easily engage in these processes. So for example, we took representatives from Sambru and Isiolo counties down to see the Stana Gauge Railway um, in Nairobi National Park and in Tuala area. And that really opened everyone's eyes to what, what the Stana Gauge Railway in the north might look like and what that would mean for their livelihoods. That helps people engage better. Um, in terms of skill strengthening, which is our second pillar, we've really tried to develop local capacity to engage with these processes. I don't think that civil society in general has been very good at prioritizing relationship building um, between the conservation sector, between CBOs um, and the infrastructure sector to make sure that, that there's that flow of communication. Um, and so we've tried to build that capacity in the landscape, both in our organizations and through training um, of communities. And, and other organizations like Natural Justice, for example, has been training practically paralegals in this landscape um, to assist with monitoring and enforcement of environmental management plans. I think that's really critical. Um, and then our third, third project pillar is around direct project engagement. And in terms of this one, um, we've really tried to seek out um, community voices and, and um, knowledge in terms of influencing these projects. So I'll give you two examples. Um, the first being um, the Lamu to Lokacha crude oil pipeline development, um, where we engage with our local teams as well as communities um, to look at how that, that um, crude oil pipeline could be rerouted around a critical area um, for both livestock and gravy zebra. And as a result of that, in the very robust uh, relationship that we've created um, between between the organization, between the communities um, and the crude oil pipeline consortium, we were actually able to have that section of the pipeline rerouted. Um, and the second example is looking at a proposed project as part of LAPSET, which is the Isiolo to Lokacha highway development, where we're looking at both wildlife and livestock corridors. And they're really one and the same often. And um, people use the same corridors that wildlife use, wildlife use the same corridors that people and livestock use. And so by taking that more integrated approach to data inputs to inform these developments, I think we can achieve um, some gains. And we've been informed by the LAPSET team that several of those recommendations are, um, are being considered. So I think in terms of the overall benefits, um, of deeper engagement, of, of engagement both within the system and the processes that we have and without the system, um, I think we can have more robust outcomes um, for certainly for our landscape up in the north. Thanks, Chris. Fantastic. Thank you, Sarah. That was really, really helpful and great to, to hear those kind of specific case study examples that you were sharing. Um, actually, I think you've, uh, you've managed to return from the, yes. the wilderness online. <laughs> so welcome back. I hope you didn't miss mm -hmm. too much of, uh, of Geddes' no, no. presentation. Um, so the, the question I wanted to just put to you to, to get us rolling here was about um, your experience of working in, in civil society advocacy campaigns around infrastructure. Um, you know, what role do you see for citizen-led advocacy in helping to ensure that infrastructure development is done in a way which is, is sustainable for society as well as for the environment? I think to, to answer that question, <clears throat> we need to start with, um, you know, what is the purpose of, of public consultation 
or the correct type of planning for these um, kind of projects. It's really about understanding where are the blind spots, you know, for, for the project proponents, where are their blind spots? What are the issues they don't see? What are the power dynamics they don't see? Uh, what are the unintended consequences they may not have considered, etc. Now, when you look at what uh, Gedis uh, put in his presentation, you know, he talked about the, the complex social and political spaces and relationships, the inequality, power and social political contestations, you then see that a lot of issues that are of interest to many groups of people are often not considered in some of these projects because um, they, they are not part of that ruling elite or the project proponents, etc. And so you need a process by which that those views, those interests and those blind spots are highlighted. Now, if there's either an unintentional or intentional ignoring of those interests or viewpoints, then that is where your citizen-led advocacy comes in because you need to then raise your voice as these different groups and make yourselves heard as to what those... Yes, thank you. And uh, my apologies, even my backup is failing me today. Um, yeah, so I was saying, um, you know, when there's either a, a deliberate or unintentional ignoring of these voices and interests in the planning of these projects, then this is where citizen-led advocacy is, is very important. Um, you know, this is where these groups which are marginalized or not being heard can raise their voice and bring to light uh, some of these issues. Apart from that, I think also uh, what was mentioned in, in the presentation was that um, you know, the government cannot see everything. I think that was a quote uh, mentioned there from an official. They cannot oversee everything. Again, citizen-led advocacy helps to bring some of these issues to the fore where there is oversight then brought to some of these issues which would otherwise be, uh, be ignored or just not seen. Uh, however, I think there's a larger uh, aspect to all of this that we should consider. In the very initial part of the presentation, there were lots of quotes talking about how um, you know, these sorts of large uh, mega projects are sort of an insight or a representation of the evolution of society or leads to that evolution of society. Um, I would go on to say how we implement and plan those projects is in fact a reflection of that society, either in its current form of, or how we want it to evolve as well. So if you're in improving the kind of democracy, uh, inclusivity of planning, et cetera, in these projects, then eventually that's the kind of society you also model with everything else you do. Um, so I think it's, it's really important that citizen-led advocacy is, is, is improved with, with these projects because it then leads to those other spin-offs that are hugely beneficial to society. If I can give some quick examples, um, you know, with the SGR project, it was only the, the citizen advocacy and involvement that led to the public knowledge that perhaps the Kenyan government has put the port of Mombasa as collateral uh, on the loans from, from China for these projects, which was not known earlier, obviously, because a lot of the project was shrouded in transparency. That particular aspect um, was then later picked up by the Auditor General in his report, saying this is a huge issue that needs to be addressed. Had it not been for citizen advocacy, I don't think that would have been picked up. The same thing with the recent uh, court cases, which, which were determined uh, that the entire procurement for the SGR was illegal. So we already have an issue that was shrouded in secrecy, but because of citizen-led advocacy, we, it was, the issue was brought to the courts and it was determined that this whole project actually was illegally done. So I think there's a huge role to play in uh, for citizen advocacy, both in highlighting issues that are being ignored or uh, left out, but also to increase things like transparency and ultimately modeling these in society going forward. Excellent, thank you. That, that was great. And uh, in the middle there, you, you used a phrase, I think you may have misspoken, but actually rather liked it, which is you said it was shrouded in transparency. And <laughs> I think you can, uh, you can always imagine that that's talking about the, um, the kind of rhetoric of transparency is actually often not backed up by the realities. That's quite, I thought that was a really nice turn of phrase. Great, we're getting 